Welcome, everybody. This is Tony Ucita Velez. I'm here to talk about an exciting topic, which is how to introduce a threat model as a blueprint for both security offense and defense. So this is a presentation where both red teamers and blue teamers can hopefully take some uh, takeaways from in order to, to uh, build better security response measures, better attack measures when you're attacking uh, a scoped out environment. A little bit about myself, uh, I am a chapter leader for OWASP in the Atlanta uh, region and the United States. I'm also the author of uh, Risk-Centric Threat Modeling, which is a uh, threat modeling methodology that me and a co-author, Marco Morana from um, the UK, uh, was basically helped to, to develop this methodology, which is risk-focused. And we published a book together uh, in 2015 with Wiley Life Sciences. Um, it is a risk-centric threat modeling methodology that we'll actually cover in today's presentation. Uh, basically, really a, a big threat modeling evangelist, and I've had a lot of great interesting conversations with multinational companies in my travels and leading uh, the, uh, the Verse Bright company, which is a global security consult consulting firm. So a lot of my thoughts and sharings of today in terms of uh, lessons learned and approaches really comes from you know, 23 years of industry experience in IT, NIS, and also, you know, 13 years of running a, a global security consulting firm with my broad team. So uh, let's just dive right in. You know, the first area that we're really going to look into is first trying to level set on some misinterpretations and how to properly consider threat into both a red team capacity as well as a blue team capacity. Now, obviously, you know, from a, uh, a red team standpoint, you know, our goal as a red teamer is to attack, right? We want to be able to collect trophies as part of an engagement. We want to be able to, um, you know, take uh, per uh, establish persistence in a client network environment. Um, obviously, be able to demonstrate how you can pilfer data stores, databases, applications, whatever is in scope for testing. And traditionally, red teamers have this mindset that is is basically triggered from what they're targeting in the environment. So if you're targeting an organization as a red team or if you're doing a pen test uh, of an application, usually the the uh, what you're pen testing or what you're red teaming dictates a lot of what you do in terms of your approach and methodology. And sure, there's a lot of great uh, methodologies and approaches uh, you know that are out there, you know, beginning with, you know, the Crest organization having a, uh, a methodology and approach that really looks at the best of breed in terms of steps for you know, uh, open source intelligence gathering all the way to exploitation and post-exploitation. But what we want to do here is begin with a threat model. And, and why do we want to do that? Well, oftentimes when you're attacking an organization um, as, as a white hat, you want to be able to really emulate true adversaries, right? And sometimes that's not done as well but when you're just basically looking at the environment and the target asset is basically dictating what you do next. So you might run into an Apache web server and say, oh, let me try some Apache, you know, types of exploits based upon some vulnerabilities I'm seeing. Um, so the whole exercise really becomes, you know, just uh, focused around the types of components that you have in scope. Now, the difference with using a threat model is first you take a step back. Threat modeling is really meant to build better red teaming and blue teams in the sense that it adds context to realistic attack objectives, which true cyber criminals want to, want to achieve. Um, a, a key misunderstanding in the, you know, the white hat infosec uh, cybersecurity professional space is that, you know, oftentimes a vulnerabilities automatically implies a threat. And that's not necessarily too, uh, true. Um, so when, you know, oftentimes red, uh, red teamers or people that are doing, you know, pen tests, Obviously, one of the first things that they'll do as part of their process or second or tertiary things that they'll do, actually, is to be able to identify what vulnerabilities are in their environment. And that, to them, may imply, oh, this is a threat. The presence of a vulnerability automatically equates to a threat, and that's far from the, far from the case. So it's important to understand what is a threat in, 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 the, English, you know, uh, uh, in the English language. And a threat is a possibility of a menace. Uh, of occurring with a specific motive and objective. And, and a vulnerability is simply a means to which that threat could realize with an attack. So I just mentioned those three words there that oftentimes get 
sometimes misconstrued in you know when when doing uh, adversarial exercises. Now it's important that red teamers you know beyond understanding that let's uh, let's let's introduce this threat notion into our red teaming activities. They also need to understand what the attack surface is. But you know not just simply from you know attack surface when you're doing a red team oftentimes might translate to scope. And that's not, you know, how a true cyber criminal will look at it. You know, they'll, they'll define the attack surface based upon overall intent. They'll look at infrastructure, they'll look at people, they'll look at process, they'll look at supply chain vendors. And all of these things equate to a means to an end where the end may be a threat motive. Uh, it's also important that, you know, there's a level of organization as you identify, as you be begin with this parent uh, hierarchy, this hierarchy that begins with a threat node and affects components that you map out vulnerabilities that, al that align to those components. And then you identify which exploits could actually best affect those vulnerabilities. We're going to introduce uh, something called an attack tree a little bit later on. And we're gonna actually going to see that attack tree exemplified in the energy sector as a way to basically demonstrate how this could all be organized. So there's a lot of benefits of, of using a threat model to organize red teaming, um, some of which is that you can also build attack and threat libraries because oftentimes, you know, uh, white hats have really a difficult time of truly uh, emulating criminal intent. And uh, so it's important that, uh, you know, a, a, a true threat library based upon current threat patterns, threat motives, current adversarial groups, gets depicted in a threat library and similarly so for an attack library. Now, uh, the, the great thing about threat models is that it's looking at the full stack of what could be attacked. You know, true criminals oftentimes will look at people process technology and within technology you have network, you have infrastructure, you have cloud, you have mobile client, you have, you know, you have, you have the full gamut of things that are at their disposal and interest to target. Um, Similarly, you know, red teamers should kind of think of it the same way. Oftentimes when we do pen testing, you know, right or wrong with whoever we're doing pen testing with, whether you're doing internal pen testing or you're a firm doing pen testing for someone else, you can get scoped into a box that doesn't truly emulate what uh, a cyber um, criminal may, may actually do. Now let's flip this and look at it from a defensive standpoint. So where does a threat model really come in? So um, oftentimes when you're in a security operations center, you have eyes on glass, as the, as the term is said, where you're looking at alerts come in every minute, and it's, those alerts are coming in from firewalls and IDSs and IPSs and host-based agents. So, you know, there's numerous different alerts that are coming in, you know, from the infrastructure. Which alerts do you focus on the most? So the threat model builds context based upon threat data that you harvest from within your infrastructure as well as threat intelligence. So it's important that um, as blue teamers or those that are involved in security operations, substantiate the threats. Understand what are the threats that you're uh, responding to in terms of those events, in terms of those alerts with, uh, for your security incident event monitoring solutions. It's also important to correlate threat intel from the outside to, to, to see how that intelligence is talking about current uh, and recent uh, incidents, um, uh, observable incidents that have basically affected other companies within your industry, within your sub-industry. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. So, you know, the, 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 the big point here is context on both. Oftentimes when you're in the SOC, you don't really you can't substantiate that the alerts that you're triaging are actually, a, um, you know, supporting threat patterns that actually exist, you know, because oftentimes the alerts that we get within, you know, our respective security operations are triggered by tools. And these tools are largely signature based. And these signatures were developed, well intended, um, by oftentimes researchers within those product companies. But the point in time in which the signatures were introduced is a long, long, long time ago compared to what are some of the current threats and trends that are happening today. And so, you know, the, the, the big example I'd like to provide is how do you know that even like reconnaissance type traffic uh, or maybe access control violation isn't actually something that relates to a broader threat pattern, a broader threat motive. If we're just looking at alerts that pop up 
in our respective tool set, then we might be caught flat-footed and lose that context that we need in order to recognize a true threat versus simply an alert. Okay, so let's talk about, again, some additional terms that are oftentimes misconstrued, you know, especially um, when we're storming the castle or defending the castle, which really applies to both uh, the red team aspect and the blue team aspect. So, you know, threat modeling, you know, there's, a, there's right now threat modeling is hot. It's a hot topic, a lot of people talking about it, but oftentimes they bypass one of the main intents of threat modeling, and that is to model your threats. Do you understand as a adversarial uh, uh, person emulating adversarial tendencies or someone defending the castle, do you understand what the threats are? What's at stake? Um, and so it's, it's, it's important to understand what is threat modeling, also to understand what is the attack surface that you're truly defending. So let's talk on the second bullet point here. Let me just focus on the blue team for a second. So again, you know, stemming from a lot of my experience, both you know within the private and public sector, as well as consulting over over a decade, I've seen that a lot of you know companies oftentimes, as as part of a security program best practices, quote unquote, they buy what I call Noah's Ark security. Two of every tool set that's out there. They you know, implement it, install it, they get alerts, there's metrics, there's dashboards, and then they're feeling that you know, there's some level of you know, coverage that's actually happening. There might be, but it, I would say that it's, it's more coincidence than anything else because they're not really thinking about how all those alerts that are tripping on you know, endpoint alerts or infrastructure alerts or application-related alerts truly correlates to threats that are specific to their industry. And what we're going to look at a little bit later on is we're going to focus on the energy sector and kind of see how we can exemplify the benefit of threat modeling as compared to just simply not having a threat model and just simply going about instantiating a security operations process or attack patterns to get it against uh, the energy sector without a threat model. And, and clearly there'll be some differences that hopefully will be appreciated. So the, the attack surface in simple terms can define the scope for penetration tests. They can also define the scope or areas what you want to log. You know, determining what you want to log, you know, I, I don't think it would be irrational to basically ask, would you like a solution provider with your technology set to determine what you would like to log as it relates to you in the healthcare sector or in the uh, gaming, you know, sector or what about hospitality industry? or, you know, fintech area. You know, obviously, you know, what you want to log, it, there's some general things like, you know, um, violations and access, access control, I think are important across the board. But there's, there's some things that are gonna be specific for certain types of industries where data is the most important thing, continuity of business is the mo most important thing, or the integrity of the data is the most important thing. So the threat model puts all those things into context, and you can substantiate a lot of those things with the threat intelligence uh, that you pull in from the outside, but as well as threat data that you pull from your infrastructure to let you know what is actually going on, what's alerting today, and what are signs that there's actually threats that correlate to my threat model. Now, I talked about this methodology in the beginning where me and my co-author basically developed this, uh, this, this uh, risk-centric threat modeling methodology. It's actually called PASTA. And if you Google threat modeling and PASTA, you're going to basically get a lot of hits um, of this risk-centric threat modeling methodology. But in a nutshell, it's a seven-phase process. Each phase has different activities. And you can take this methodology and make it five, make it four stages. You can take the best out of it and, and suit it to how you need it based upon your organization, your amount of resources, et cetera. But um, the process for attack simulation and threat analysis, which is what PASTA really stands for, was really built on the fact that we need to look at security from more of an adversarial lens. We need to get into the mindset of uh, the true cyber criminal and try to understand intent so we can define possible attack patterns. And so, um, you know, just quickly running down, where can this benefit red and blue teams? There's, you know, the fact that unlike other threat modeling methodologies, 
it looks at the full stack. And when we say that in IT or in the technology sense, it means you know, the, the, you know, when you speak of the full stack, it can mean a lot of things. It can mean, you know, the full stack of your architecture, right, of what you're going to be attacking or defending. You know, the presentation layer, the business logic application layer, and then the backend data layer. It could also mean the full stack of infrastructure that supports systems, that supports applications, um, that supports data. So, you know, all of these different layers, if you will, you know, really need a thorough understanding it could have unique attack patterns against them right so we need a methodology that encompasses the full stack and just really quickly the first three the first three um you know uh, stages of the process for attack simulation and threat analysis really are meant to define the context of importance around what's in scope so as an example you know um an oil you know energy an oil production company you know, their main thing is research, the confidentiality of, of research of what they find in terms of new places to drill, as an example, as well as continuity. They want to make sure that, you know, well spots are operational, they're pumping millions and, bi and billions of barrels of, of uh, crude oil, you know, uh, as much as possible in order to make money, obviously. So establishing that context is really important. And if you think about it from a defensive side, that makes it more contextual to what you really need to keep your eyes open for, where you need to calibrate all your alerts, where you need to kind of focus more. On the adversarial side, it adds some context where, where do you want to focus in more in order to create the biggest pain? Maybe you want to do extortion. Maybe in order to do extortion, if you extort, if you try to have an extortion plan, you know, through, let's say, a ransomware attack, um, and if you, you don't basically apply it to the right type of infrastructure or servers, then as a cyber criminal, you're going to be wasting your time. And so um, you really want, you know, from, from emulating a, a um, cyber exercises and through a red, uh, a red team, you really want to focus on what are the things that are going to, going to cause the biggest impact. And, and again, this is identified usually in the first stage. The second stage defines the, the scope of, of your attack surface. The third stage allows for us to understand how does it all work together, right? You can't defend or even attack what you don't understand because otherwise you're just shooting blind. And then the other phases really between the fourth, fifth, and sixth phase are really more adversarial, right? Um, they're, and then even from a blue team perspective, like you wanna understand what types of threats you have to correlate into your your, your your overall program into what you're you know configuring for logging and alerting. Um, you want to understand how the presence of vulnerabilities within your environment actually facilitates the likelihood that threats can actually happen. And then the attack phase is simply the smoking gun. You know, I call it the smoking gun because you know oftentimes when you're trying to everyone has who's a security professional recognizes that remediation is not an easy process, right? Oftentimes we have to sell remediation within our respective um, enterprises and companies and, pri and private sectors, public sectors as well, where you're having to kind of almost convince you know, certain team members to remediate things. Well, if you can demonstrate that an attack is viable based upon the presence of a vulnerability and it basically can re realize a threat objective or threat motive that is current with trends um, that is supported by Threat Intel, it's, it, it would be reckless for anyone that owns that information or owns that infrastructure to turn a blind eye. Now, at the end, the, the reason that, you know, POST or the process for attack simulation and threat analysis is called, uh, uh, is, is called a risk-centric approach because everything is about contextualizing both the importance of what we're trying to defend or attack as well, you know, as, in terms of how the importance of what we're um, willing to remediate or develop countermeasures for. I'm not going to go into that much more detail. I just simply wanted to share this maturity model. I did talk about how, you know, if, if you're looking to, if you've never done threat modeling and you just want to be able to try it out and maybe, you know, understand a little bit, a little bit more about pasta as an example, there's some suggestive, very simplistic, you know, maturity steps that you can take. And just really quickly is, you know, from a from a defensive side, this, this is what I call a blind threat model. 
And step one of PASTA, you know, says, listen, I align to multiple frameworks that, you know, are best practices, maybe ISO, maybe some hardening guides from my cloud service provider, CIS benchmarks. I mean, there's obviously a ton of different things that you can align your infrastructure hardening, system hardening, cloud best practices, et cetera. So in doing that, you know, you can basically um, establish what I call a blind threat model. You know, from the very beginning, once you're trying to understand the attack surface and define the objectives of what you're trying to defend, you can then correlate the type of assets that you have with the type of best practices that exist for those assets. And when I say assets, that's again across the full stack. Oh, application, you know, system, network, et cetera. Now, um, this middle step here is really, you know, geared for both red teamers and, you know, blue teamers. So, you know, I, let's, let's talk about the red teaming for a second. So you're going to pen test an environment. You're going to pen test, you're going to red team a company. Well, why not take evidence of what types of adversarial, maybe some incidents that have affected that industry in the past 24 months that you can try to emulate. Because what happens in the real world is that oftentimes when there's successful cyber criminals, they, they share a lot of their means and ways in which they did things. The, the tools that were used, the payloads that were used, the malware that was used, the attack vectors that were used, you know, these techniques don't stand in isolation. They basically are shared and there's a lot of hiring and, and subcontracting, if you will, of some of these different, you know, um, adversarial groups that are you know out to fulfill an objective so as a red teamer why wouldn't you try to emulate what are some realistic you know attack patterns or threats motives that um you know real cyber criminals are are, are doing you know, again similar similar type infrastructure similar type applications or similar type you know companies now evolving more to a full risk-based threat model you know, this is where you do a lot more analytics. There's a lot of different, you know, the future in security is, is definitely going to be an automation. There's a lot of major players, you know, everyone from VMware to some of, some of, some of the new uh, startup companies within the, indus the industry that are looking to have more sophisticated uh, automation that is backed by artificial intelligence or machine learning. So there's a couple different companies that are out there, for example, where they're going to run a lot of different automatic, you know, pen tests against, you know, a target, let's say API or against a target listener or a daemon or service that's running. And, you know, the purpose of automation is to, you know, in, in the context of threat modeling, to be honest, is to look at the probability coefficient for risk. So in, in, in a risk centric approach, you really want to demonstrate that this attack pattern, this type of attack is completely viable because then you can present irrefutable evidence to your client, to the system owner, to the infrastructure owner, the CTO, whomever your audience is to say, we did a battery of tests, you know, this worked 100% of the time, 80% of the time. And there's multiple different companies that exist that have that technology to do that. But the, the main point I'm trying to, to say here is that you can use metrics to demonstrate the, the probability increases with certain types of um, testing. Now you can still do this manually, and um, you can still, you know, you know, test. Let's say that you want to test the likelihood of injection-based attacks, and you throw, you know, 500 different types of payloads against, you know, API endpoints, and you see that, you know, you know, you have a high, you have a high success rate. When it comes to injection-based attacks, you can maybe some of those injection-based attacks allow you to take data out, which correlates to confidentiality loss, which should correlate to, you know, defining what is impactful in the POSTA threat model. So, yeah, as you can see, we're slowly trying to connect the dots. And that's really what the risk-centric approach to uh, threat modeling is all about, is connecting the dots with context for both uh, a, a red team and a blue team context. Okay. so. What are your what should your objectives be when you're trying to build your threat model and 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 what what are what are some things that you can do uh, in the early stages of threat modeling? Well, one is you know we want to substantiate your your activities as a red team or as a blue team. Right now, individually, the, the substantiation of what we do as a blue team, for example, oftentimes, um, from my experience, comes from largely tool led enterprises 
you know, they, they, they have the means to buy multiple different tools. They, they, they read that, you know, there, there's certain obviously non-negotiable types of logs that are important. I mentioned a couple of them before, like access control violations, I think is, is, is pretty much a non-negotiable. It's always something that you want to look at, but there might be other types of alerts that are really tuned to your threat landscape, to your industry. Right. And I mentioned a couple different sectors before. So you want to substantiate your defensive mode of what you're looking at and contextualize those alerts to say, does this fall? Does this alert or event fall within my threat model? And where does it fall into? Does it fall into the attack surface of my infrastructure, my systems, um, my cloud environment, et cetera? So it just provides, you know, a realistic consideration as to how do you tie threats into your actual uh, uh, scope of assets that you're analyzing. So, um, you know, in doing and substantiating your, your threat model, you know, one thing that you can do is to build your threat library. And a threat library is really simple to do. Oftentimes, you know, when you hear the word library, you're thinking about an exhaustive list of, of, of things that you need to enumerate. But if, I will, we'll go through an example threat library shortly on where, where you can see how the library can help to be a centerpiece for how you attack and how you defend. But in order to get there, you really have to research threat data, threat intelligence reports, analyze the data correlated to the most relevant um, attack patterns that again support those threats, uh, and also correlated to your environment. And then incorporate it, incorporate it into your pen testing regimen. When you define the threats and the attack surface and what you're after, if you're trying to basically demonstrate that you can you know, uh, attack an environment and use it to introduce malware through file upload use cases within an application environment and continuity is king for that environment, then, you know, you can basically support it from the threat intel that you have against an industry all the way down to the vulnerability and to the attack patterns. Now, let's take a look about that case study. I referenced it many times early on, and in the second phase, we're gonna look at a you know um, oil and gas company based in the uh, the Nordic region. Um, so let's just think about you know the industry you know before you know the, the cyberspace, if you will. You know traditional threats that affect oil and gas from a physical nature are you know all of those things that are listed in bullet points there. You know you can have internal sabotage, organized crime may want to attack it for different reasons. Uh, maybe they're hired hacker syndicates or disruptors. Uh, there might be insurgency or terrorism. So there's a whole list of inherent threats. And then now you add on the cyber layer where you have interconnected platforms and web enabled interfaces to you know, sophisticated devices that are on you know, oil rigs or well spots, then you, know, you were actually amplifying the threat landscape. So here's some cyber related threats that we can we can begin to incorporate into a threat threat library. And um, if this is basically, you know, again, focused on the kind of oil and gas. Taining data is maybe a threat motive by a competitive or a corporate sanction attack. You know, you might have, you know, obviously natural resources, you know, is is a is a scarce commodity. There is a lot of competition for exploration rights to different, you know, areas on the planet, you know, whether it be, you know, international waters or land. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously getting information about where, you know, ripe natural resources locations are is important for all the players that are in that space. And then once you're actually tapping into the resources and collecting metrics on the quality or the amount being mined, et cetera, uh, that's data that basically helps you know, um, operational team members to make decisions, right? And so if they're making decisions on information, <clears throat> a, threat, a threat motive might be to taint that information so that they can basically get disrupted. And then by the time that they figure out that their data has been tainted, they've actually, you know, either uh, poorly utilized some of their infrastructure to maximize their, their, uh, their exploration or whatever they're, they're actually doing. Extortion is a key one. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in, in a second um, with actually a real case scenario that actually happened. But, you know, continuity is very important in this business. And so when you basically interrupt the availability or the flow of the supply chain, if you will, uh, or even the research data that helps to determine yay or nay on different types of exploration activities, 
then you're 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 uh, you're actually shaping up a, a right threat motive for an adversarial group. So from a te pen testing standpoint, how do you emulate that, right? From a red from a blue team standpoint, what types of events and infrastructure? Again, going back to your attack surface, what types of events do you want to look at? It says, hey, this this could actually relate to some level of extortion, you know, um, based upon some pre-attack level recon, maybe some open source intelligence gathering, some fingerprinting done against the infrastructure, maybe some um, types of uh, invasive techniques to upload malicious malware, you know, through some of the ransomwares or some of the key attack vectors or, or payloads, if you will, that are, are used for those types of uh, threat motives. Um, mining cryptocurrency, you know, so there's, you know, the thing about the oil and gas, you know, infrastructure is that they, their IT footprint in terms of resources, I mean, they, they need sophisticated infrastructure, but there may not be, you know, as big of an IT presence in terms of humans that, you know, compared to, for example, the financial sector, right? So, you know, when, if you're a crypto, if you want to do crypto jacking or if you want to leverage infrastructure, you know, for, from someone else, then you go to uh, industries where you know that there's not a lot of people watching, right? You want to go to powerful infrastructures where you know that they may not have the most sophisticated means to detect rogue technology, rogue software. Maybe you have a, um, if you're able to introduce, you know, multiple different crypto uh, clients, software clients that do mining across, for example, um, you know, a pretty robust cloud platform, that's great for you because you're passively collecting money, and you're able to, um, you know, mine uh, some, some cryptocurrency in the process. Uh, the other pro the other threat here is of stealing secrets. Obviously, there it goes without saying that exploration and research and development is super proprietary. So maintaining uh, the secrecy of that information is really important. Okay, so let's talk about, um, you know, an actual. So uh, so this threat library. Let's take a look at this uh, this this. Um, this company in the Nordic region, what they basically had is they, they migrated, they, they've been migrating a lot to uh, the um, to the cloud. And, you know, the cloud introduces its own set of inherent threats and attack patterns. But, you know, add, add to that the support of cloud infrastructure, cloud applications. In this case, it was through a third party supply vendor that basically provided a lot of the cloud, uh, uh, a cloud solution for managing well spots. Um, so this is a cloud-based uh, multi-tenant application that basically allowed for this particular uh, Nordic um, oil and gas oil company to uh, focus in on, on, on wellheads, uh, wellhead operations. So, you know, one of the threat motives here from an adversarial standpoint, let's say we're pen testing this application. And again, this application is really part of a third party. You know, what we want to do is we, if, if we're going to basically pick one item from our threat library, let's say we want to do extortion, what aspect of, you know, the wellhead operations can actually be affected where we can introduce some level of malware all the way down to the wellhead where there might be um, some interface between the cloud, a web API, all the way down to um, a uh, um, a kind of a, um, industrial control system or uh, a device that, that is web enabled, right? So you have a web enabled device that's physically sitting at, at the, the well spot. What sort of, um, you know, injection based attack can you do where you can actually, you know, break the system? You can actually, you know, um, encrypt the system and hold it for ransom and, and do that, you know, across all the different uh, well spots that are managed by this wellhead um, application. So that, as an example, would be a great abuse case from a pen testing standpoint. Um, another one, you know, from a defensive standpoint might be, if you flip that one, is to see what sort of use cases within the application do support, let's say, uh, file uploads. So what we're seeing here is on the right side is that once, you know, once you get to, you know, there's a couple different use cases that this particular uh, application supports. And if one of them might be, you know, the ability to upload files. And let's say that the application doesn't really do a good job of inspecting those types of files and that you can perpetrate a legitimate file with a uh, illegitimate file that's actually, you know, malware related, then th there could be uh, an opportunity for 
some level of remote code execution of that malware on that particular device that's actually at the wellhead. So, um, you know, ironically, this, I, when I did this presentation, uh, when I first developed it, it was uh, some time ago, and coincidentally, in recent news events, this particular uh, uh, oil conglomerate was actually extorted as recently as they were the victims of ransomware. So, um, you know, that when, when you're building a threat library, you know, I, I had initially, you know, the one major step there was doing the research, right? You, all, you obviously have to understand a lot of what are the likely criminal intents and threat motives from the cyber criminal's perspective. And that's going to allow you to defend better. It's going to allow you to attack much better. Um, something that I like to do when we basically do engagements, whether it be organizational threat models or application threat models, or even like building a framework for security operation groups to defend against, is that we establish kind of a, a threat modeling card. And what this does is summarizes the library that's at stake against, you know, with the motives that are, you know, substantiated by threat intel. It correlates that to the attack surface at a broad level for the organization and the specific attack patterns. Now, these specific attack patterns, you know, you can leverage within the, as, a, as a security operations center team member to say what attack, what types of logs and alerts would actually correlate to these types of attack patterns. So just looking at this very, very simple list, you might see that, well, how can I get email-based alerts that relates to spear phishing? Maybe I want to look at that. What types of, you know, again, um, uh, 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 application alerts can alert me on file uploads that fall outside the norm, fall outside of maybe my, my, my white list of acceptable parameters? So those are just two very simple examples where, you as a blue teamer, you can actually start to hone in on things that correlate to attack patterns that are, are gonna target your industry. And in this specific case, coincidentally, this particular company was actually affected by ransomware and you know it cost them some downtime. And if you wanna unitize what downtime is in the oil sector, it's not any you know small number to laugh at. But this is a great type of summary card that you can build and you can correlate what types of uh, threats actually are going to be, you know, correlated to your attack patterns. And then, you know, something that I also like to do in addition is to see what types of countermeasures or controls does, you know, my client, uh, my, the scope of the application actually support today. So I can look at the residual risk of, you know, at a very, very high level of what types of controls exist to mitigate some of these different types of attacks. And obviously, uh, I want to be able to tap into those controls and see what sort of events and logs they trigger from a blue team perspective. Okay, um, I didn't mean to skip over this slide. This is a very important slide, especially for all my red teamers out there. So attack trees is something that um, allows us to organize our and, and really kind of blueprint our attack patterns. We basically begin with defining a threat from our threat library. So that's the box in red. We then decide, okay, what types of attacks and, and now I'm going back to the vernacular because oftentimes people use in security threats and attacks synonymously and they're not. You know, threat is a possibility. Attack is actually a, an exercise pattern that, you know, takes place and usually in support of a broader objective, like a threat motive. So we're looking at it, you know, this threat, uh, this threat of like, I want to sabotage, you know, uh, alarm data. You know, uh, there's a use case in the, uh, well spot operations that relates to, you know, flaring alarm data. So maybe you want to disable it, maybe you want to subjugate it, but you, you basically in premise, you establish a threat and that, that parent node is going to have underlying attacks. Now that underlying attacks, you know, you can use a threat library like KTEC is a great threat library and you can kind of see what types of uh, attacks, attack patterns correlate to vulnerabilities that would realize the, a successful attack. And then, so those vulnerabilities, you could use CVEs if they're related to systems and infrastructure. Maybe you actually have vulnerabilities that there's, there's none, there's none that have been defined. And maybe you, you, you can basically employ the use of someone to do it to develop the viability of a zero day to see if there truly is a possibility of a vulnerability to allow for rogue sensor parts to be implemented into the well spot in this example. 
But you go from there, and, and sometimes you can also, like we looked at a web application that was in the cloud, you might actually leverage uh, CWE for uh, weaknesses. So the point here is that we map a threat to an attack to what's wrong, which is the vulnerability or weakness. We correlate that to the component you know, that's in use, otherwise uh, um, known to be a component within our attack surface. So the ones that are deleted, uh, denoted with black boxes are areas of scope that we want to attack, maybe as part of our pen test. And so uh, in, in all, the, the attack tree provides an excellent visual blueprint for a red teamer to conduct an adversarial exercise to test the viability of all those different branches, and it completely accentuates the report because now you're establishing credence at the very top with the threat objective, with the threat motive, with the threat that is supported by threat intel from the industry of your client or your own particular you know, company that you might be pen testing for. So, you know, I, I can't really advocate this enough. I think it's a, a great way to really kind of change the game on how we do red team and blue teaming. But let me close with this last section of the presentation where we really look at, you know, some, you know, industry perspective and adversarial tendencies that we can kind of leverage as part of, um, you know, threat modeling, uh, building a threat library, and, and also looking at uh, better ways for um, focusing, you know, some security monitoring. So. Speaking of monitoring, you know, as a former, you know, SOC analyst myself, where, you know, you're, you're trapped in the dungeon, your eyes on glass, you're working first, second, third shift, hopefully not, you know, um, altogether, but you're, you know, you're, you're, you're spending a lot of time looking at alerts day after day after day after day. And, and so um, anyone that's out there that is in that role or has been in that role basically can relate and probably has some some level of uh, traumatic scarring from looking at all those alerts. But, you know, here we see where most of that scarring, you know, kind of playfully just kind of just uh, depicting that, where you have, you know, sometimes up to a million alerts that come in. And, you know, in the early days where there wasn't a, a correlation engine that would correlate a lot of things for security engineers, they were looking at raw events. And this would just obviously desensitize the, the security analysts. Where we are today is that, you know, there's a lot of uh, basic rules and advanced rules that are doing some correlation. There's some pattern detection. You know, there's some basic, you know, filtering and aggregation so that you're not seeing, you know, a thousand alerts uniquely or maybe correlated to one type. And that's all well and good. But in the end, we still have some opportunity to even create a wrapper, if you will, where it's a threat model that uh, it's, it's a threat. It's based upon threat context, right? So you build a threat model, you build a threat library, and for the uh, threat library, we basically define what are the attacks, what are the vulnerabilities that support the viability of this threat? And so this allows you to basically get to the, to the tighter end of the funnel where you're really looking at events that makes the most impact, that basically, that really can, can save the company. So you wanna use the human intellectual capital when uh, when it's not desensitized and you want to have his or her focus be on the alerts that actually matter. So this is where a risk-centric threat modeling approach comes in like CASA where you can get there. Now, um, building a future threat library really requires input from a lot of different, you know, uh, talented people. Um, what's important for an organization, whether you're, you know, a security analyst, and you're, you're doing it for an organization, you want to understand what the context is of importance from the people that run the company. You know, one of the things that I always tell all of our team members at Versprite is, do you understand how your client makes money? That's the first question you gotta know as a security professional, whether you're on a blue team or a red team. And to understand that business, you know, impact of what you're attacking or what you're defending, is it really anchors um, how you're gonna message your findings later on. Obviously, you gotta be able to think like a hacker. And thinking like a hacker sounds easy. There is a lot of um, you know, uh, stereotypes of what a hacker looks like, how a hacker acts. The best hacker, hacker is the one that 
basically it doesn't fall into the stereotype, right? It's, it's, you want to be, it's, it's more about the mindset. How do you, how do you bypass? How do you defeat? How do you elude? How do you evade? How do you subjugate? How do you, you know, um, uh, how, how do you basically, how do you basically achieve your objective, which might be hacktivism, which might be uh, corporate IP theft, which might be, you know, personal data, you know, uh, theft. How do you achieve those objectives with the attack patterns to the components within the attack surface that you're defining? That's really important. Um, sound technologists. So you can't, if you don't understand the technology, then you probably won't hack it very well. You also probably, you know, won't understand it very well if you're from an alerting side. But I would think that the technology awareness and understanding probably affects the red teamer more than the blue teamer, um, but you, not by much. And so it's important to understand like what type, how the technologies work, because in understanding the use cases and design, that's where you as a hacker can understand how to develop abuse cases and ways to defeat the design pattern that's in place. Now I will leave, th this is a phenomenal schema that um, uh, was developed initially by you know, some uh, projects led from MITRE and was taken over by OASIS. But the um, STIX uh, basically uh, framework is a security framework for threat intelligence sharing and exchange. And it basically has many constructs. It has nine different constructs. And a lot of the constructs you know, center around information that alone are super important. Let's just take you know, the top one there called indicator. So indicators of compromise within the framework of sticks has multiple different let's say data elements that you can populate and in today in the industry there are multiple different players that are sharing threat intel where they have uh, this construct populated and they're sharing it a lot of the isacs like the fs isac and uh, other types of isacs that are out there or cert agencies um, computer emergency response teams are employing the use of services and tools where a lot of threat information is being shared. So from a red team or blue team perspective, you know, there is a, uh, there is a taxonomy, there is a framework where, you know, your, your related activities for attacking could fall into, you know, populating some of the information within here. So from a blue team perspective, you know, let's say that you want to consume threat intel that shows indicators of compromise within your sub-industry or industry. And so that's important for you because that provides threat intelligence that might be relatable to threat motives that are affecting you within your particular sector. And that's really important. Um, the, as from a pen testing standpoint, you know, there might be, uh, you know, the, the, the main area there is that, uh, that, uh, yeah, that, that horse chess piece, uh, purple item there is TTP, you know, for tools, tactics, and, and, uh, procedures where you're going to have different types of uh, patterns that are going to uh, facilitate attack against a target component, a target infrastructure, you know, a target, uh, aspect within your overall attack surface. So the great thing about this framework is that there, there's, uh, intermappings. So, the more information you can collect of indicators of compromise are actually incidents that took place. Another construct within the STIX framework that can allow you to, um, you know, that can be extremely useful. Obviously, you want to know incidents that took place uh, within your respective industry. All those things are good intel that you can share. And uh, we, we need to be able to, to leverage more of the tools and, and, and companies that are actually committing to to uh, leveraging this framework because it's extremely well thought out and there's ways in which you can actually map uh, some of the different constructs to things like CVEs for vulnerabilities, things like CAPEX for attack patterns, uh, or even the new attack post-exploitation framework. So there's, there's great opportunity here and interoperability that can serve uh, both red teamers and blue teamers. So last but not least, you know, I, uh, it's every sector has great information for contextualizing threats. If you're walking away from this presentation and you're like, you know what, let me take a stab at building a threat library, that's awesome because that's the first step in really uh, establishing a good threat model, specifically within a risk-centric approach. So 
um, oftentimes when you're within a different sector, you can go to different ISACs that support your sector. I have kind of like my just personal grades in terms of what I think some of the intel is. Some of these sectors, some of these intel sharing resources are still maturing. Some other of them are, 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 are great. Twitter is a great source of intel. Um, you might be able to find, for example, things that are on, you know, Twitter that might relate to, or other types of social media platforms that relate to observables, one of the constructs in the STICS framework, as an example. But I encourage everyone to uh, start to, to, to research something specific to your respective industry or sub-industry and specific also to your attack surface that you're trying to defend or attack so that you can emulate and build a better plan for a red teaming engagement or a better uh, framework for uh, incident and event monitoring and response. So uh, if you want uh, to ask me some questions or you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm T0NYUV, and or you can follow me on LinkedIn as well. Email is there on the, on the uh, slide. And if you have some additional questions, there is actually more information on the process for attack simulation and threat analysis on the universebright.com website. Thank you so much for your time and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you all.